Well, good morning, everybody. I just want to start off again today with the same map we did yesterday, which is the uh, all hazards weather map from the National Weather Service. So this is just before six o'clock this morning, and we're kind of getting two big ideas here. We've got the smoke that's causing air quality issues across much here of the northern tier of the United States. And then we have the frost and freeze advisories and warnings that stretch throughout parts of the eastern Corn Belt into New England. And just thinking about this, I want to go straight to our frost discussion first, because the latest update from the National Digital Forecast Database, so this comes from the National Weather Service, shows that over the next uh, seven days, and this is really going to boil down to just two events, one this morning and then one tomorrow morning, we're just trying to identify where the frost risk is. So remember, this map shows uh, the potential. So anything that uh, the forecast goes below 35 is what I've got uh, shown here, because we get a lot of patchy frost, both at higher elevation and at low elevation, where the cold air drains. Um, during um, during these events. So just thinking about this, I, I was checking a couple of areas this morning. First one, I went to this pocket right here uh, in, in Ohio. Um, you know, this is a very important part of our eastern Corn Belt here in Michigan and getting into Pennsylvania. And I was just taking a close look at some of those temperatures. So I picked out one location, Warren, Ohio, because I was curious with this temperature. They were at 33 degrees at uh, 6.56 a.m. Eastern time. And I was just curious um, how rare of, of a frost event this is for this location. So if you come down here and you look over the last 40 years, um, they still had about eight or nine frost events that happened today or later in the last 40 years. So we could roughly say that, uh, you know, about four in 10 of their, um, or about 40% of their frost events do occur on or after this date. Um, so while it's not a surprise, uh, historically speaking, it is problematic this year given the progress and how warm things had been lately um, to, to, to what this is doing, going to do to the crops. So I went and I looked kind of carefully. I'm going to use a site here um, that comes from the National Center for Atmospheric Research, NCAR, and it allows us to see all of the weather stations. Uh, and so what I'm going to do here is I'm going to choose 9 UTC. So this would have been just before the sun rose. I'm going to come over here to this grouping of, of stations. We're going to look. Now remember, let's let's use this one as an example. When you look at these station plots, the only value we're going to be interested in today is going to be um, the one in the upper left. That's going to be the temperature at this particular time. So this again was just before sunrise, and I'm looking down here and I'm seeing a lot of 33, 34, up by the lake of 31. Interior of Pennsylvania, northern, I got some 20s here, and, and there's a couple of places that, that were quite cold there into New York. But I tried to find uh, areas in uh, Ohio where the stations were measuring uh, below 32 degrees. And I didn't see it th at this particular point, and nor did I see it after the sun rose. But that does not mean there's not frost damage, because this is only where the weather stations are. We have a lot of local effects with terrain that can allow the temperatures to fluctuate 5 to 10 degrees. So I imagine we're going to see this morning uh, several pictures in this area of, of where there was some frost damage. And this extends again, you know, if you kind of just hug this particular spot right up here in the parts of Michigan, we do see some of these numbers down here, 35, 34, uh, I got a 31 uh, right here. So this uh, this was pretty cool. Come over to like London, Ontario, a 32. So why did this happen? Uh, well, there's several reasons, but some of the most largest kind of contributing factors dealt with this. So there's just a big anticyclone, big area of, of high pressure sitting here, and that's made very, very calm winds. And so therefore, you don't have the wind to mix up the uh, temperatures in the lower atmosphere. So you get a very strong temperature inversion, very cold at the surface. You go up 30, 40, 50 feet, and it can be 5, 6, 7 degrees warmer above that. So we had the strong uh, uh, radiational cooling at the surface giving us this. And about the only thing I could see in terms of cloud cover to trap some of that heat in wasn't actually clouds. Just as the sun was rising this morning, all of this is uh, smoke, wildfire smoke. And um, maybe did it prevent a much worse event in parts of Ohio? Uh, possibly. Uh, the wildfire smoke could, could in fact behave a bit like cloud cover trapping in some of that heat. But I'm going to show you yesterday real quick. Just kind of slide back here. Again, the fires up in, in, in Canada. All of the smoke is just trapped into this broader trough that's over the area. And uh, so the flow of the atmosphere is what brought it down, but just very thick. I imagine a lot of us were out looking at the sun last night as it set uh, in this area, just seeing um, how red it was and how hazy it was. Now, while that was going on, we had a lot of tough storms uh, down here in the southeast, some that ran right up the plains. Some of these were, were hail producers, which we want to talk about in a second. But first, I just want to finish this discussion on minimum temperatures and frost threat. So we've talked about this this morning. This is what the forecast was for this morning. So we're trying to identify if the initialization of the model was um, was pretty good. 
and uh, you can see the heat west and, and the cold east but then we go into tomorrow morning we're going to watch this corner here of, of north dakota now it could be possible to get some patchy frost in places in south dakota and montana but right now we're going to watch very carefully right into this area if the winds pick up at all or if there's a little bit better cloud cover we'd be in much better shape but i don't see it right now so this is getting into then saturday and sunday and monday and what we're going to watch is that colder air advance east through the weekend and that's going to come in on a big high pressure cell and then we go back over very mild again and more than likely if we get out this far into may frost risk across major growing areas in the u.s um, is is done historically all right now a moment ago i mentioned some of the severe weather and we saw those storms yesterday <clears throat> just want to show you the storm reports a lot of wind reports down here and dotted with some hail kind of running up the the, the the high plains and western plains here but i just got asked like how do we how are we tracking this year on severe weather so this is just kind of our annual severe weather report every dot represents a different severe weather event and if you come down here and just have a look we are currently at a total of almost 7,000 reports of severe weather most of them coming from hail but 732 tornadoes so far on the year which is uh, quite active the most active month right now is march and if we just take a look at March, uh, you know, you can break this down. Tornadoes, this is of course, the big outbreak on the 31st, wind damage and hail. Take a look at the hail that we've seen so far this year. And then I'd like to take you back real quick and show you the current month, May. Uh, by the way, if you're interested, right now the state with the most tornado reports, let me glance through this, uh, it appears to be Illinois. Illinois because of that March 31st event. And we click on May. And this is where our severe weather has been, <clears throat> excuse me, has been this May. And so much this year has caught my attention about the hail reports. Not only, I mean, we've had the strong winds and the tornadoes, yes, but the hail that's hit the center part of the United States has done just a lot of early season damage. Thinking about that, this is where we're watching out for strong to severe storms today. So marginal risks down here in parts of Alabama, Texas getting up into this part of the plains, and then here with the frontal boundary that's sliding through Wisconsin. So there's another front coming through tonight. And then what we'll see is tomorrow that front sags far enough to the south that it interacts with quite a bit of Gulf moisture. So we're going to keep most of Texas over to the lower Mississippi River Valley, kind of in our sights for severe storms. Day three, this will be the 20th that pushes all the way down to the, the Gulf Coast states down here. So let's go have a look at this. And this is the um, high res NAM at 6 a.m. So I think today in this forecast, it's a competition between two high pressure cells. The first one sitting here right now this morning, that's one that cleared out the skies and gave us the frost. We're still watching scattered precip in the south and throughout the plains. But this is the frontal boundary we'll be keeping an eye on. So going through the midday on Thursday, you see that front by this evening goes through Wisconsin out of Minnesota and stretches right down through here. And then that's where we expect to see some of the storms again blowing up in this part of the plains. There is a coastal low that's sitting down here. It's quite weak. It's kind of broken off from the rest of the flow, but it might be bringing in some scattered rain to parts of uh, Georgia and South Carolina. So kind of keep your eye on two things, this and the frontal boundary here. This is tonight, set at 8 p.m. Playing forward, you notice there's kind of a short wave pulling out of part of Texas, and it's going to ride the frontal boundary here. And I said this was kind of a story of two high pressure cells. This is the high pressure cell tomorrow morning that we're going to be watching carefully for the frost risk in western North Dakota. Now, as we see where the moisture from the coastal system goes, by Friday morning into Friday midday, it's spreading rain into parts of North Carolina. But then this frontal boundary and the high pressure cell that's behind it's going to continue to push things forward. So Friday night, remember, we're going to keep an eye on this area for strong to severe storms. And then as we play out here to the beginning of the weekend, this is the high pressure cell that just cleans things out in the midsection of the country. Over the next seven days, we have a large swath of the U.S., this whole swath in through here that's going to be drier. We're drier in this part of Texas. We're drier in the west. We have wetter conditions, thankfully, coming into Alberta. I'll show you that system in a second here. We need this to, to put these fires out or help put them out. And most of what you see here is coming from the system we just talked about coming up the east coast. So our best chances for, for repeated chances of storms is going to be right in through this corridor here in Texas, Oklahoma, getting up to Colorado. The upper level pattern, I was just looking at it this morning. I'm waiting to see when it's going to shift away from this. So that's the short way bringing the front through the midsection of the country all the way to the east. And then this is the wave right here that's going to help with the wildfire threat going on in, um, in Alberta. So that's going to be Monday. 
but overall this pattern is relatively weak. It does attempt to return to some sort of southwest flow, but this is not the right setup having something cut off down here to fully just fuel another major severe weather outbreak at the end of the month. I think we're going to get some stronger storms at the end of the month. But uh, if we had a ridge here versus a trough, it'd be an entirely different story uh, overall. So that just gets us out the next week, and we can kind of keep playing this forward. I'm looking for any just dramatic features like deep troughs coming in or massive ridges building. So you're going to see this pattern flatten out a bit and, and, and kind of get away from some of the extremes we've seen. So next week, in terms of precipitation anomalies, we have two wider cores. There's this one, and then there's this. And of course, what we've got going on here is primarily happening over the next couple of days. Where we're drier, it's just a broad section here of the country, right in through here. To see that on the high-res models, this is the uh, NAM, or excuse me, the European model. We've already watched through, you know, about this point on Saturday, that Saturday evening, getting into the weekend. So by the weekend, scattered storms here up the mountains. The front clears were relatively dry in the midsection of the country for the weekend. And then you remember that little shortwave that's coming through Monday. This is by Tuesday morning. It's delivering some rain here. So playing forward into Tuesday again, we just watch this area for storms. There's the overall deeper trough that's over Florida, keeping it cloudy and cooler and wet. And then we play into next Wednesday. And we remember that we're going to try to flip this back into a little bit of southwest flow, which means next week we're going to keep an eye on this quarter for starting to see better chances for storms. But right now, this is what the models are kicking out. But to show you that week two idea, you do notice that again, the GFS, whoops, which is over here, the European model, which is there, and the CPC here, all trying to push the wetter weather back into the central United States and eventually to the Midwest uh, while pushing the, the drier conditions from the Mid-South to New England farther to the East. So we've got a consistent picture there between our models. All right, real quick, back to that temperature discussion. Let me show you highs. This is today's high temperature getting into tomorrow. So this is that colder air coming in with that high pressure cell while the heat stays in the Pacific Northwest. This is probably our hottest day of the week here in uh, Columbia Basin. And then we go into Sunday, Monday. That's when the trough comes through that's going to bring the rain to Alberta. Out here toward Tuesday into Wednesday, a lot of warmth starting to spread. And over the next seven days, here's what we're looking at at accumulating GDDs. So these numbers are bouncing back up after the, the cold air coming in on Friday. And then if we look at what the temperature pattern is going to do in that five-day sliding window, this is just taking you out there. We're going to pause it right here at day 5 through 10, which would be the 23rd through the 28th, and then the start of June. So we do notice that along the southern tier of the U.S., we're keeping a cooler bias, just slightly so. And much of Canadian Prairie and the rest of the United States seeing near normal to above normal temperatures to start the month of June. This is not due, to, though, to massive ridging events that can cause early season heat stress. Finally, tonight in my in-depth report, one of the things we're going to talk about is the, the flipping and flopping of the long-range models. We've now seen the beginning of June, uh, the first half of June, go back over to what our initial thoughts were, that this region had better chances of seeing a lot of thunderstorms in early June. So the CFSV2 is there. We'll get the new European model date about 4 o'clock today. I'll be sure to show that to you. One last thing to talk about internationally, what's going on in the weather. We're quite cool in Australia and dry. You take a look here, much of Europe's going to have a bit of a drier week, except for right along the Mediterranean. But then when you get over to parts of uh, West or Eastern Ukraine, excuse me, in Western Russia, we're looking at wetter conditions. No real um, kind of strong signals that have me worried about what's going on throughout China's Northern Plain and Manchurian Plain. But South America, we just continue to see the end of the monsoon, which means it's drier in through here. Uh, where this is problematic is in Southern Brazil, where it's quite dry. But we're still seeing the rains coming through here uh, the end of this week and through the weekend coming into Argentina up to Paraguay. So uh, that'll also stretch down to Uruguay, which is here. So just important to watch these late season rains in South America. Okay, thanks. We'll talk to you again tonight in the In-Depth Report. Have a good one.